Here we go. So we're recording. All right, so welcome everyone. So pleased to have you all with us today. I'm really excited to kick off our second uh, session in our storytelling series. We're doing a series of five uh, different speakers who represent different perspectives in statewide OER leadership and um, really thrilled to have Evan Abbey with us here today. And I wanted to share a little bit around uh, why we're doing this storytelling series. And well, I should introduce myself as well. I am Megan Simmons. I am uh, the Associate Director of Training and Design at ISCME. And um, we uh, work in a lot of different areas in, in OER. Um, most people know of us through our digital library, OER Commons, and uh, our team um, does a lot of the technical work there, a lot of the um, field building work there and research associated with OER implementation. And um, I think I have the best job because I get to work with the wonderful uh, educators and, and leaders and librarians all throughout the US and even international. We work globally as well. And as part of my work doing uh, leading our training and design program, we like to keep the OER conversation going and webinars is a great way to connect with folks all over and i know this is specifically targeted towards statewide leaders but we also have had some international interest and in attendees which is really great to see um and um yeah so this this storytelling session really came out of um an interest from uh, states who either through different initiatives like go open through the u.s department of ed or um through just different policy measures that, that they're taking as a state or, or as schools um, to really look deeply into how OER can impact their work. We received a lot of requests for uh, folks to hear from other uh, statewide leaders that are successfully doing this work, uh, especially uh, folks that have been doing this for a couple years. And um, so we, uh, as a team, looked at the different projects that we've been doing and supporting and, and folks in the field that we thought were just really uh, great people to connect and, and hear their stories and have asked uh, five different individuals to be a part of this storytelling series, really with the intention to hear a, a, a personal narrative of their journeys of how they went from uh, starting out with, you know, maybe what is OER to, to where they are today and the different lessons that they've learned along the way. So really excited to, to have Evan with us here today. He uh, is the program director at the area education agencies of Iowa professional development learning. And um, he really is a leader in his state. He's someone that we turn to for inspiration and ideas. Uh, we've been really impressed with the leadership and, and what he's done to really support OER adoption throughout Iowa. He's a great connector and has spread the OER movement uh, not only within his state, but throughout the country. And he has a really interesting background and has worked in a lot of different areas of education from being a language arts teacher to a technology director and a high school principal. And he brings all of this experience into his current role and um, has really been, been doing some great work in, in Iowa and beyond. And I'm really pleased to welcome Evan today um, I'm going to hand it over to him in just a minute, but just wanted to let folks know that um, we're going to be using chat for questions or comments that come up. So hopefully you can see where that is if you scroll on the screen and see the little chat icon and click on that. We invite you to um, introduce yourselves and share any questions or comments that come up. And I will be monitoring those as Evan shares his story and then once he's done sharing his story, we'll have some time at the end of the session today to have uh, a, a discussion and answer your questions. So really looking forward to, to that uh, part as well. But without further ado, I'd like to uh, once again welcome Evan and you all and uh, really uh, excited to hear, hear his story of OER adoption and, and design in, in Iowa. So. With that, I'll, I'll hand it to you, Evan. Thanks so much for being here. All right, thanks for the introduction. Um, as mentioned, uh, my name is Evan Abbey, 
And I uh, just want to double check that my I'm unmuted here. Um, the um, I guess the first thing I'm going to do before I get going in, I, I just kind of want to set the stage a little bit because whenever I know I attend a different session, I always want to kind of find my fit um, as a listener, as an audience member to what the presenter is saying. So I think when it comes to educational leadership, there's always a spectrum from control uh, on one end and influence on the other. And as you, uh, you know, the people who have the most control uh, in any class are typically the teachers right there. And as you move away from that, you get to a building principal and then a curriculum director and then maybe a superintendent. And then you get to some of these statewide leadership positions or uh, higher ed, you know, uh, schools of education or whatever. And you lose a lot of your control over how well anything is implemented. Uh, but hopefully, <laughs> that's, hopefully we gain influence the further we move this way, the further you can go and, and uh, operationalize at a statewide level. Uh, hopefully you can uh, gain influence and do good things that way. Um, that's been my journey, uh, my professional journey is that I've, I've just lost control my entire life. Um, and uh, hopefully I have gained some influence to go and, and work with educators and, and push for things that I have found and I, you know, I believe in. And um, the idea of openness and uh, OER in specific is one of those things that I do, you know, I do believe in. I think if we're here today, we probably already believe in that. So, so one of the questions for me that's always wrestling in my mind is how can I best take and, and utilize influence to help those that do have control be empowered to go and understand you know, what OER has and, and then go and act on it and make things that uh, are useful for them to do. So if you come to this session as a, uh, in a statewide position, you're going to be more kind of on that end. Some individuals will be more um, like a curriculum director and actually have a little bit more control, um, uh, especially over their um, immediate district and such, a little less influence over like the whole state. Um, and so hopefully some of the lessons learned that I have uh, learned from my particular role will, will apply to wherever you fit on that spectrum. So, um, I, I, just a little bit about our program. So uh, mentioned the Area Education of Agencies of Iowa, AEA is our acronym. Uh, we are like the BOCES or the intermediary units or the ESUs or we're just the Iowa flavor of that uh, intermediary unit between the state department of education and the local school districts uh, we're regional service agencies um, for the most part most of what the aeas provide is they provide special education services um, unlike a lot of other entities uh, throughout the united states uh, the aeas are chartered to provide equity uh, in services among school districts so we try to identify services that uh, some wealthy districts might have that other districts don't. We try to then um, uh, make sure that other districts have access to those same services and what we provide. Um, we have other things that we're chartered to do as well. It's not just that, but um, one of the things that we were traditionally seen as special education over the past few years, though, we've done more and more with both professional learning, which we've got about a 20, 25 year experience working with that's really ramped up here recently, as well as uh, media and technology services uh, to help districts with that too. So it's kind of an intersection for um, what, uh, what this topic is about. I oversee a program. I don't work for one specific AEA because there's, there's nine in the state. I oversee a program that's a collaborative of all of them. And a few years ago, the AEAs came together and said, when it comes to online professional development, rather than each of us doing our own thing, let's go and actually work together and have one collaborative that does it on behalf of all of us. Now, that's, that's not something that can be done by other uh, entities. Other states work in different manners. Uh, some are competitive with each other. Uh, but in Iowa, they're not. They're not necessarily competitive with each other. They have the same goals. And so I have overseen a program that delivers first online professional development, then services to help schools deliver their own online learning. Then we added services to help schools deliver their own online and bl or blended and personalized learning. And that's kind of even morphed now into this OER uh, category as well. So we're looking for services that can help empower schools and trying to do those efficiently 
um, from our agency. We're not a big agency. We have six, our FTE is six and a half people. So we try to do things that we can with six and a half people. And uh, our, we have a one and a half million dollar operational budget uh, that we work with. So a lot of our things are built on how can we do so efficiently and through partnering with the, the local schools. All right, so that uh, being said, uh, let me talk a little bit about Iowa because our state is, of course, every state in the union is unique and Iowa is no different. I was contemplating adding some uh, images of uh, some common stereotypes from Iowa, but I decided to cut those at the last minute. So um, we have some things to know about Iowa. We do have pretty decent school funding. We're not the most funded uh, in the country, but we're not the least funded. We have had tighter budgets over the past uh, about eight years. A lot of different agencies in the state have been cut. Um, and uh, that not just school districts, but also the State Department of Education and such. Uh, we tend to be more on the decentralized control aspect than other states. We don't have a statewide textbook. We don't have a lot of direction um, from the state to saying you have to do it this way, you have to do it this way. Iowa was the last state to adopt state standards. Uh, they held out for many, many years. And so that's kind of a common tradition within Iowa. Local school districts and their, their communities and their school boards still have a lot of influence. And while you might think that that can lead to a lot of districts kind of being, you know, resisting change and, and still operating under the same way that they did back in the 70s and 80s, and that happens somewhat in Iowa. It also allows school districts to go and kind of move ahead too and push the envelope a little bit. And we've had some different experiences with that. Um, and my bullet here says progressive on technology access. Iowa is one of the leaders in terms of throughput in the number of one-to-one -one, um, uh, uh, initiatives, uh, access for students. In other words, more students in, in are um, uh, a part of a one-to-one -one program have a one-to-one -one device in their class than uh, just about any state. I was amongst the leaders in that. And that didn't happen again because of a, there wasn't a statewide buy and a statewide money applied to this, but it kind of happened by one district pushing the envelope and other districts trying to keep up with the Joneses and moving forward with that. And it's kind of an interesting dynamic. Districts feel empowered to go and try things like that and push the envelope. And then what happens is sometimes districts can get invested in a product without uh, knowing or you know, fall, if, uh, having some pitfalls. One-to-one -one especially can be a very expensive proposition if you're not gonna use technology effectively for learning. It becomes a pretty expensive way to do worksheets. Um, so because Iowa doesn't have tight control over those things, you know, that's where it's really important for regional service agencies like the AEAs to go and try to help districts understand and, and uh, uh, go through processes of self-improvement and, and to really refine their, uh, their systemic processes for, for that. Uh, we are not progressive on online learning. In fact, we are a little bit regressive on that. Uh, we're kind of in the back half of the states for that. We do have uh, some things that we've moved forward. Um, it's not that we don't have any online learning opportunities, but we don't have a statewide online uh, school. We've got an online program that's done through our Iowa Department of Education, but it has a smaller amount of enrollments and such. Um, so uh, and a lot of times online learning is a driver for uh, open educational resources. So that's why I thought I might throw that into the cases that that isn't necessarily the case here in Iowa. I've already talked about AEAs as being a structure uh, for uh, equity. And again, that's I think something important to, to understand when I talk about Iowa and our journey. All right, so uh, one of the questions that kind of the series, this is gonna be series really looks at is when the speakers are, thinking through this, I want to think about what are the challenges that their state is facing. And we're, we're no different. We have, uh, we have challenges as well. So I, I identified some of these. Again, I mentioned that the uh, Department of Education uh, has been cut drastically. It's, uh, it's a, uh, a shell of what it was even a decade ago. And because of that, we're not a go open state, despite uh, pretty good usage of OER in the state and a lot of demand. We've got a lot of districts saying, hey, why aren't we a go open state? Uh, the Iowa Department of Education has some political um, pushback 
on doing on, on embracing that. So they have elected not to uh, not to do that. And I think that's a it's a good choice. They don't always have the um, the person power to go and implement uh, initiatives uh, on top of that. But um, they have noticed that anything that gets attached with the Iowa Department of Education tends to be thought of as um, uh, bad within the Iowa legislature, which is not necessarily a um, political efforts that, uh, that we want to keep. So the Iowa Department of Education, one of our partners in this, uh, has not been able to take an active leadership role. One of the biggest issues we've had is that uh, just having common understanding. And I'm going to illustrate this a little bit better as we go, but we have a lot of people saying, we love OER. And then when you ask them to describe OER, they're going to have a different definition than the person sitting next to them. Um, and I think that before really embracing um, uh, professional learning and, and other activities to help teachers with that, we really have had to identify what OER is and what it is not. Again, I'll, I'll mention that a little bit more. Um, we want to stress that it's not an issue of finding curricular resources. Uh, when I first started teaching, uh, my second year of teaching, Google came out, uh, the search engine, and that gives you a uh, uh, thought about how old I am. And um, it, when I uh, was doing uh, student learning projects and Google came out or the search engine came out, I just changed my whole understanding you know, of, of education. I was just blown away with how many resources that we could go and, and find. Uh, well, they've got, you know, teachers now have access to a lot of different resources and they have their places where they want to go and, you know, their go-to places. We have many teachers who will go to Pinterest. That's their go-to place. We have many teachers who go to teacher paid teachers. That's their go-to place. Uh, obviously, from a personal standpoint, I have some qualms about the quality of items that you might find there. But I think rather than try to say, Oh, here's a OER is a way in which you know let's let's emphasize where you can go find OER or that type of thing. It's more of a conversation of how do you know what you find is good? How do you know what you find is something that you can have an effect on that and you can customize and work for your classroom? And I think that's one of those you change the approach away from uh, a discussion about how where you can find those to more discussion about. How do you know this is good? How can you use it? Uh, well, big challenge is the conversation about OER not being the same as free, or what I should say is open, not being the same as free. We have a lot of districts that are really enamored with the thought of free textbooks. And that's a perk of OER, as you know, but that's not why you should do OER. If you're just getting a free textbook, you're missing out, I feel, in the state of Iowa, we feel on the biggest benefits for that. We we struggle with that approach, even when districts sometimes pay lip service to the thoughts that um, oh yeah yeah there's there's these other aspects of, of OER that are important. Some of it boils down to yeah we can save this much money um, on a textbook buy if we do this, um, and so we have to you know we have to talk a little bit about return on investment and how much time you would invest in, in this work and it's you know just kind of change some misconceptions about that um and so that kind of leads into the next bullet where we talk about the purpose uh, of oer i'll mention some more about that too um and the other thing too is that we want the the implementation and the use of OER in instructional practice not to be seen as something extra. Um, and that's, this is a key theme in everything that we uh, try to do in Iowa. Whether we're successful in it or not uh, remains to be seen. Uh, we have all gone through the initiative du jour, right? When something new comes out, um, and it can be really great stuff, but we almost always seem to approach that as here's something separate that we've got to go and have special professional development for, special plans for, special everything else for, whether it's like, you know, gardeners, uh, multiple intelligences, or response to intervention, or whatever the case is. You want to, it's really key to go and say, how does this apply to what we're already doing over here? And that's a process that we've we've learned we've wrestled with we've had experience with that with other initiatives and this is kind of a common 
thing that if we're going to do work in an area over here, we have to first start by saying, how does this apply to these other areas that we're already working on? All right, so what I came away with were some of the, what I identify as the key takeaways from my uh, experience working with uh, the AEAs, and in turn, the AEAs experience working with districts. What are the things that uh, we have tried to do with our uh, implementation strategy as we go. Um, I do have in the chat a link to this presentation. I probably should have led with that. Uh, so I do have some hyperlinks in here. Uh, and so you can grab the presentation and you can click on the hyperlinks um, on your own if you'd like to have access to those things. So uh, one of the uh, key items we start with is uh, we want to, um, I'm big on the term an explanation. Um, and I mean that uh, in a very specific manner. Um, if you have ever watched uh, Lee Lefevre, he was the common craft guy. He made those common craft videos on, um, you know, uh, blogging in plain English or whatever in plain English. Uh, really good, short, uh, minimalistic video that explained a concept and did so through a story, told a story, and gave people some specific things to remember to go and um, build their own understanding of as they go. And that's, that's been one of the key aspects for us too, is that we, when we visit with schools, when we visit with teachers, we always frame it in terms of a story, that this is, here's a district, and this is what this district's challenges are, and this is how the district is uh, addressing those and such. Um, as part of that, we talk about um, some key aspects that we make sure are part of that story. These are key takeaways that they understand. I mentioned open is not the same as free. Um, and so we talk about this concept of openness. Um, and part of openness has to do with the understanding of the five R's, as you know. Um, and that's obviously part of that discussion. Um, physically, how does, it, how does it look to be open? What does it mean to be able to reuse, remix, revise all these different aspects to the curriculum? Um, we always have a discussion about who owns the curriculum and, um, you know, and that's, that's kind of an, an important aspect for thing. Another way to phrase that that we often talk about, um, we have teachers visit about is who owns learning in general. And if you use a textbook or you use a curricular series uh, and such, how much ownership does the local teacher have over that learning. Um, in some cases, it's very little. Uh, we, we talk a lot about how a lot of districts look at this and say, we pay our teachers not just to be the implementers of a book, you know, like, oh, we've got a curricular guide, and so this teacher is going to go through the motions and make sure the curriculum guide is delivered. Our teachers are there to be professionals. They are professional experts on taking curriculum, curricular resources, and actively making decisions about teaching those. And part of those decisions is, uh, includes, is this the right curriculum? What do I add to the curriculum? Making decisions about what curriculum gets used and how, we, how it's used. And that's, that's, uh, that's, that's a new element for a lot of districts to consider, a lot of teachers to consider, is that teachers should have uh, as a professional, an active role in that ownership of the curriculum. And then we extend it even further and say, okay, what active role do students have? Shouldn't students have their own, uh, an active role in ownership? And how much ownership does a student have in a textbook that's already been defined and can't be edited and you start from page one and you end on page 400 and, and, and you do the whole thing? And again, that begets a lot of questions about why, and that helps precede our thoughts on, well, how do you actually use that when you do? Another aspect that we really, a question we ask as part of these explanation stories, um, we talk about how schools have asked the question, is curriculum ever finished? Now, there are easy ways to look at that. You know, you could look at that in terms of social studies and say that, oh, I could create a lesson for government, but our government changes daily. Um, and, you know, we have aspects of government that are always changing. And so I need to have curriculum that can change and adopt and uh, um, be modified as we go. Okay, and that makes sense for things that we know 
have some element of current events with them. But what about elements that are more static, like um, physics? Um, that's probably not a good example. I probably could have someone come, you know, raise their hand and say, oh, well, physics is changing daily and, and such. But that's kind of some of the pushback that we get uh, in terms of curriculum is, well, you know, everything's been written on um, physics and or topic X or whatever. So you, it, you don't have to go and modify it or change it. Um, when you do have to modify it, it makes sense to do that. But what isn't part of that discussion is what's the best way to teach those things? And maybe the way that a concept has been explained in the past could be better explained now. Uh, every textbook you go through has ways in which they explain concepts. They have analogies that they write or they have infographics that they provide and such. And those analogies and infographics can become out of date even if the concept stays the same. So that's one of the discussions about this is that curriculum itself, the topics of them change, the way we teach those topics change and can be improved. And the fact is that when we develop curriculum, we should never reach a point where it's like, this is good, we're not touching it anymore. Curriculum uh, should always be revised. And that's the concept, uh, a philosophy that we try to emphasize when it comes to OER with teaching, is that if you get to a point in your teaching practice where you feel like you're just doing the same thing and you're not thinking about what you're teaching, you've lost a lot of the power uh, of curriculum. Curriculum can be a dynamic, adaptive process. And the other aspect to that is it should also be a collaborative process as well. We silo teachers away, even if we give them the power to go and have some ownership into identifying resources and remixing resources or even developing their own resources. We don't necessarily do a good job of connecting them with other teachers. We don't provide them opportunities to learn from one another to um, calibrate their understandings or to see what other people have done or haven't done uh, to improve our own professional practice. Well, OER is a perfect place to do that. And again, a lot of you already know this, but it helps, re, you know, by using OER, it helps reinforce that type of philosophy. Um, and so those are all pieces that we go in and we use to, to uh, to uh, visit with teachers, but we want to do so in a, a specific explanation, a story that helps them understand how a district is going and utilizing those. Um, if you uh, um, are interested in a little bit more in how we have crafted our story, we do have uh, some uh, videos on our website um, where we talk through that. Um, and again, I, uh, Leela Fever wrote a book and has done several videos on what he calls the art of explanation, which is kind of, again, one of the takeaways I've had to really help go and deliver uh, statewide influence, uh, statewide implementation where I only have influence, helping teachers understand by being able to tangibly grab onto an explanation has been a big lesson learned for me. We also have a document, and if I click it open here, uh, we use this to um, uh, help teachers understand. So I'll zoom in a little bit. Uh, we call this the who, what, where, when, why, and how of OER. Uh, this is an infographic we use to, to uh, hit the high points and to make um, uh, things tangible. And again, this can be easily shared, easily referenced. Uh, teachers can look at this ahead of time before we do professional learning. And so we're not spending a whole lot of time going through some of these basic tenets and such. We have built some self-paced learning modules and activities that go through and kind of uh, help teachers understand these materials as well. But in terms of building common understanding, this infographic has helped considerably. So oh, I just closed my window, which I didn't mean to do. The second item, the lesson learned that I would probably identify is that in order to move a state forward, and obviously moving a state forward is kind of a, a vague term that could look differently depending on the state, how you define moving forward. Uh, but you have, to identify, you have to think through how are people coming to this particular topic? What are the doors, the doorways that people come to this table 
and say, yes, I'm interested in knowing more about OER. I want to know more about this. We have several in Iowa. And so part of this is to acknowledge this and to kind of think through the services and strategies that you use to make sure that you're uh, applying to these. So we have some states, as mentioned, that were really pushing the envelope, much like our one-to-one -one initiative, but doing so through Go Open districts, uh, identifying themselves as Go Open districts. Some districts doing an excellent job of that. Some districts signing up for Go Open for, as mentioned, uh, some of the purposes that we're not as uh, um, supportive of, like, hey, this is just free textbooks and such. So that's, I mean, that's one aspect. How can we help districts better implement a Go Open initiative? Um, we also have a lot of districts that are, as mentioned, one-to-one -one users. We have 360 districts in Iowa and over 300 are one-to-one -one, uh, uh, districts. One of the challenges they have is that districts are continuously looking for better ways to go and to integrate their technology for learning. And oftentimes they get, um, they, they want to take advantage of other avenues by which they can do that. And they see OER as a great marriage for technology and learning because it helps, it's a connection point for them. So they're looking at better ways to enhance their one-to-one -one initiative that they already have. They have the devices, now they want to use them better. Here's a way to go and do that. We have a lot of districts that have constructive learning models uh, for um, whether it's project-based learning or backwards design or whatever the case is um, that they use as initiatives. And we feel that OER is a great way to go and scaffold learning rather than uh, set out learning from the beginning. So you can set your, your big idea and then help students um, go along that learning progression and select their own uh, open, uh, OER resources to help their understanding to, to complete that project or answer that big idea. We also have a large number of districts, as many states do. And this Iowa is not, um, I don't think, any different. A lot of states have a huge growth in the amount of LMS use, learning management system uses. Uh, so we had, uh, in the chat, uh, we had mentioned Schoology uh, usage, uh, Moodle, Canvas, uh, even Google Classrooms, which is a, a light LMS, I would call it, um, but Blackboard and all the different LMS types. And a lot of districts want to use LMSs as a way of management and as a way of um, structuring a systemic approach towards uh, technology-based learning. A lot of advantages in LMS as far as using it for blended learning or online learning or what have you. Um, but a lot of times beginning teachers really struggle with an LMS. So it's like, okay, I have to have a Canvas space. So I'm going to take all of my worksheets, save them as PDFs, and load them up. Okay, well, that's not really a good use of an LMS. That's just your, you, I mean, then sometimes that can be the first step. So you get comfortable using it. But to make a bigger step and to go and make it more uh, engaging and interactive and having uh, resources that can be uh, elected to take, you know, and optional resources, resources for those that are needing enrichment, those that need remediation, whatever the case is, by having access to OER, you can go and really revitalize your use of your LMS. And so we have a lot of districts looking at it for that purpose too. And that's one of the biggest, the, the nicest things about um, the OER Commons, I'll put in a plug for that because we are a, a state that uses OER Commons, is that it connects directly to learning management systems through the LTI integration. Uh, and it even has a direct connection with Google Classroom, which um, other platforms do not. So um, a teacher is within their platform, they're, they're, they're adding things, and they're saying, hey, let's take a look at, is, is there a curricular lesson that goes and kind of illustrates this concept? And lo and behold, here's an easy way to go and search. I can search the commons uh, and find it, and uh, without ever leaving my Canvas or my Moodle, I can bring it right in. Um, so LMS users is another doorway. And then in Iowa, we've got, again, a, a big push for blended learning. We see a lot of teachers have identified blended learning as an aspect that they do, whether it's flipped learning, a lot at the middle school level and the high school level, or the blended learning models, the Christensen Institute, which you see more at our elementary grades. We've got a lot of schools really um, identifying themselves as blended learning initiatives. 
And they see OER as another way of enhancing that. So we've got teachers coming uh, for uh, different purposes and such. So we want to try to create services that can work and acknowledge how those things, how OER fits with what they're already doing. Um, and we have seen bigger implementation, better implementation um, uh, when we do that, when we can connect the OER use to something that already brings them to the table. This is a very minor thing, and um, but I, we really emphasize this. I put it in caps, not to shout, but because I say this all the time. Uh, the OER Commons gets described as a repository. And earlier I mentioned that one of the challenges is that we, we uh, teachers already feel that they know where they can get curriculum. So if I come to a teacher and I say, hey, we're gonna you know, visit about OER and how this can change your classroom and we're gonna go look at how you can go, where you can go and find OER, they're gonna tune out because they already feel that they know where to find resources. Uh, and when they hear the word repository, again, that's the thought is, okay, here's just a place I go and find resources. Some will be like, well, let's see what you got there. But most of them will be like, I've already got my way of doing things. This is that. So whenever we talk about OER Commons, even if it's listed as a repository somewhere online or whatever, I stress it's not a repository. What it is, is it's a community space. It's a space where teachers can come together and work around OER in ways that they couldn't elsewhere. Uh, I feel this is absolutely critical um, to an OER initiative that you can only do so much with face-to-face -face meetings. You need to have a virtual platform where all of this type of work can happen. Um, if you haven't seen OER Commons, uh, I'm just gonna flip through some screenshots really quick for, for you here. Um, we have a hub on OER Commons. This is actually a, an old screenshot because we changed our name uh, about a year ago to AA Learning Online. But uh, a hub is kind of a space, a corner of the whole OER Commons where we can go, we can structure it, we can as a state identify uh, uh, libraries, collections, of uh, OER content that we have, that we would like to, to uh, put uh, in the hub. It doesn't keep people from uh, exploring the entire commons, but kind of brings some content to people's attention. We also use the hub to go and deliver our own uh, collections. So these are the collections that we have, I, uh, this is some of the collections, I think we've got about 30 total that we've identified, but um, some collections that are already in the commons, that we've gotten and brought and said, hey, this is a, these are some of the ones that we've looked through. We've used the Achiever rubric to go and vet on a statewide basis, you know, and, and such. Um, and that's fine and dandy. Uh, we also use it as a way to deliver our own collections. So we have a series of professional development around how to teach in an online or a blended or a personalized classroom. That's called our OLLI series. And all of our lessons from OLLI uh, are shared through that. Uh, we also, as mentioned, have a series of professional learning around blended learning called Blending and Flipping Your Classroom uh, that teachers do where they learn how to go and create their own blended videos uh, or their own uh, text-based lessons that they would use in a blended environment. One of the aspects of that process is that they then share those through the OER Commons so that their fellow classmates can help them review and revise. And we get in that process of collaborate, collaborating around the content and then collectively improving it together, um, which is kind of a back doorway into the OER process. They came in the doorway of, hey, I wanna do more with blended learning. And we, in that process, they, they build something for their classroom. Uh, teachers else in the class go and help them revise it and, Guess what? We've gone through that OER process. And then we use those, um, what they've done, we've made that part of the, uh, the collection. We have now, I think, about eight or nine statewide collections that we've made. And again, we are working with the Iowa Department of Education, which has had some statewide groups like their Iowa History Unit and such, where they put some content there as well. But it's even more than that. Um, on every screen, when you find a resource, uh, in the corner, up in the left-hand corner, you can see uh, the ability to evaluate and to align your curriculum. And that's where we talk about it being a community space. 
um, I'm going to skip through that one. So this is the process of aligning uh, uh, standards or aligning resources to particular standards. We went through, we uh, uh, used Common Core for language arts and math, uh, next gen science, but then we added the Iowa social studies standards as well. And so one of the processes that can help a teacher's professional practice is simply if I find a resource let's go through the practice of identifying what standard it addresses in the curriculum. And then let's have a way that other teachers could look at it and make their own statement and let's see if we're on the same page. Uh, that can be somewhat difficult to do outside of a technology platform, but in OER Commons, it's very easy to do. And that helps us in our professional practice. Not only can we do that, but we can also go and then evaluate the resource as well. And this on the commons is the built-in rubrics that they have to go and do that. They use the achieve rubrics and there's a scales to go and, and they have a guide for what is a three, a two, and there's a video that kind of walks people through that. So we can grab groups together and they can not only align, uh, you know, identify a, a resource and then say it addresses these standards, but then they can go in and collectively say how good of resources in these elements and then calibrate their understanding with their you know, fellow teachers that way too. It's helped because teachers feel like they're empowered with this. I'm not coming to them with right or wrong answers on what's good curriculum or this is how you do it. I'm giving them a process by which they can go and actually practice um, uh, you know, using and thinking about OER. Um, also on here, and I'm not sure I have a screenshot, the OER Commons does have methods for the development of OER too. A lot of those we do elsewhere. We have some other tools that we use. Uh, we have a statewide buy for some software and some video uh, production things that we do where uh, we have teachers do it there. But you could also use OER Commons to have teachers go and create their own original content and use that as part of that collaborative process as well. All we do with that is teachers will go and build it elsewhere and then they'll add it at the end into the commons and then we'll use the commons tools for that. Uh, the OER Commons allows you to have as many groups as you'd like, of course. So we have groups set up for our AEAs, our regional entities, but we also have them set up for our school districts too. So a school district can go in and associate their uh, um, school with uh, our hub. Um, that way schools can learn from other schools um, and see what they're doing. Um, and you can, it's kind of like a walled garden approach. You can do whatever you'd like within your uh, uh, school's group. So for example, Cedar Rapids Public School, they are a go open district. One of their efforts was to go and create a sixth grade, seventh grade and eighth grade English language arts textbook. Uh, they use the OER Commons uh, as a collaborative space to go and find and to uh, uh, evaluate the resources. And then once they were done, they actually put those into their Canvas platform and created uh, an online textbook that's then available for sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. So they use Canvas as their method for delivery of that textbook. And how they used OER Commons was simply the mechanism by which their teachers could come together and actively do the work to go and, and, and look at OER. And I think that's, that's where that platform was really kind of a missing component for, for other things. So it's a small thing to say OER Commons, not a repository, platform for community-based learning instead, but it's, it's really a bedrock for kind of how we have done things. All right, I'm gonna wrap up here. Um, the, the fourth takeaway is that we wanted to create meaningful pathways uh, for, stu uh, for teachers to go and improve their practice. What we found is building a course, a perf you know, like a two credit course is not meaningful. Uh, teachers might take that, but they're taking it not because they're coming in through a doorway. Uh, they're taking it because, well, I gotta get credit. And I'm not gonna really apply what I learned from this. So we have, uh, we've learned from other initiatives that we've done, we've not emphasized building traditional courses. We have instead is we're just now starting to use the OER Passport program. This was developed by Mountain Heights Academy, which is uh, the David Wiley School in Utah. The, uh, it's built around OER curriculum exclusively. Um, 
And uh, Sarah Weston, who is the um, curriculum and OER director for, or technology director uh, for Mountain Heights, uh, helped develop the program and has helped us with our implementation of it. It's a six step program that helps teachers kind of start and do some self paced things and actually go through the process of getting acclimated to OER Commons, because Mountain Heights uses OER Commons as well, and then um, finding resources, collaborating with other teachers, sharing their own resources, and then the top stage being what they call a next generation or next gen lesson where students create their own OER content that's then shared on the site. And there's a lot of really great value in that, which I don't, I could spend an entire hour just talking about that in and of itself. Uh, but this is a credential based program. So it's not for credit. You can earn a credential if you'd like for this, but it's another way for teachers to go um, and kind of in a self-paced manner, improve their own professional practice. We mentioned using OER as part of our blending flipping series. I do have a link to that in there. We have a lot of teachers who go through that. Um, we also have um, our statewide math group, statewide science, statewide social studies, and our statewide language arts group have gotten together and have done some work around OER. And they brought in some um, AA personnel, some local teachers and such to be a part of that statewide group to go and identify things. So for example, we have an Iowa history unit required of all fourth grade uh, teachers in Iowa and they've identified um, essentially an Iowa history uh, OER textbook of resources that they put together. Um, and then there's also regional collaborators. We have districts working with other districts on some common things. I mentioned Cedar Rapids. Cedar Rapids has developed some things locally and they're sharing those with other districts who have uh, uh, done some of the things that they've built and they're sharing, you know, and sharing back. And that process of sharing happens much better when you've embraced the whole idea of openness to begin with. Um, and so one of the places we can come in is we can help facilitate sharing. That's one thing we can do very well. We can make connection points. We can help get people to, uh, uh, at the table together so they can um, have, you know, uh, understand what, uh, what each other has and what are some of the benefits of sharing. Um, it helps us find a place and to go about doing this without being um, kind of the leading from ahead model. We, we more kind of leading from behind, if you will. Um, and then the fifth thing, and this is, this is a lesson, I mean, call a lesson learned because we're still in the process of discovering this. And this is probably my big goal when it comes to OER over the next year. I am pretty strident about this regardless of the initiative that we do. Um, yeah, it, we have to identify metrics. If we say we're going to uh, implement, integrate OER, we're going to move the needle, we're going to do more, whatever the case is, we have to define not only what that is, but how will we know when we've done it. We have to identify the metrics and we have to measure them. And that's where we're working on right now. Now, OER Commons provides usage metrics and that's been a great first layer. So we've been able to use the usage metrics in there to see how many teachers are using this, how many teachers are remixing and revising or adding their own things, how many times they've been aligned, that type of thing. And we can use that to say, are we growing? Are we getting more? Are there certain regions that are doing it more than others? Um, so that's good. We need to extend it and talk about um, uh, the teacher's uh, understanding of its, of its value. Do they, have, do they feel like they have more ownership over their learning, some qualitative uh, data from it as well? And obviously we also need to see what's the effect on student learning. And those are aspects to this that it can be very difficult from a statewide perspective to go and to do um, because you, uh, you know, at, at a local level, you have a little bit more control over student data. Uh, here you can get statewide, statewide student achievement data, but how does it apply? How can you make connections to the use of OER? And so that's where we need to, you know, that's part of our own thought process is we want to make sure what we're doing is having an effect and doing it well all the way down to the student learning. And so we were in the process of thinking through how do we do that. Uh, this is my last slide. Um, I have a link, a link to our website there. And again, that has information that we've got that we give to schools on OER. You're free to, uh, to look at that. This is a listing of our services. Um, and we mentioned the Hubspace, the LTI integration, LMSs, 
our collections that we provide as well as other ones in the state that we do. Um, we do the collaborating with content providers, networking, and, and professional development. These are things that we can do with a small number of staff. We have, as mentioned, as we're a small program. We can, we can partner with schools to deliver those uh, and have an effect. Um, obviously, even more staff, we can do more things. If you have less staff, you can do less. But that's part of the equation when it comes to this, is when you're on that spectrum of control to influence, you have to kind of see how many resources you have and what you can do with that. So, so with that said, uh, our, um, open it up to questions from the group that I can help answer. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Evan. It's just so great to see what you've done uh, with your mighty team there. And I also just love to see how open you've been to um, what other states are doing. And I, d I actually didn't even know that you had been connecting with Sarah Weston at Mountain Heights in Utah. Um, so it's great to see that cross-state collaboration. And I mean, that's kind of part of why we're, we're doing this webinar series is to help uh, states and, you know, and schools and districts inform each other's practices and all that. So it was really great. Um, one thing that came up to me, and, and I encourage um, folks to, you know, use the chat to share questions or um, if you're doing okay with background noise, you can unmute yourself and, and, and say hello and ask in person. Um, but just to kick it off, I um, am so interested in learning a little bit more about your process for identifying uh, the existing initiatives that um, really kind of open the door to OER. Uh, I feel like a lot of um, folks are interested in doing things like that, but maybe um, there might be barriers or as we see time and time again, um, so many initiatives or, you know, projects are kind of, you know, on their own islands and people don't even actually know about them. So I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit more about your process for identifying those other um, initiatives and kind of how, how, that, how that went to get them on board. Well, um... For, uh, I guess from a personal perspective, the AEAs um, provide a lot of, well, in general, we provide a lot of services and resources to districts. So some of that is direct, you know, hey, you want to know more about X? Okay, we've got a workshop, a series of uh, professional learning, whatever, around X. We could help deliver that for you. In other cases, it's more coaching. Okay, you're interested in knowing that? Okay, let me, um, I'll kind of walk you through and work with you on that process of discovery. Uh, I can be another set of, you know, ears in the room as we're collaborating around the, the leadership table about steps and I can ask some, you know, some uh, critical friend questions for the group. And the AAs can provide, you know, these different layers of things. Because we serve in that role, we're often aware of what uh, you know, districts are, are currently doing in different capacities. Not only are we aware of what they're doing, but we're also aware of where they are on the implementation curve and uh, suffice to say how well they're doing it too. Um, and that's, you know, that's an area that there, there's some, there's some discrepancies and things, you know, how systemically they're acting and how much they're in a state of continuous improvement versus, ah, uh, this was a one shot deal and this, you know, that's, so we, we as a, as a regional entity have access to what districts are doing through that exposure. Um, and then what we need to do is, as we have other services that are new uh, and, and things that maybe districts didn't ask for per se, sometimes they do ask for them, but in this case OER, maybe there's some districts that don't even know what OER is. And so they don't know what they don't know and they can't even ask for it. But they do know what you know, they are a one-to-one -one district and we've got, as mentioned, a lot of those. Okay, well, I can start asking the questions about, you know, how are teachers using the technology? Is it, you know, what, what are they doing with the, the you know, laptops in there? What are, do you, do you have all online textbooks for those? Are students able to access those textbooks at home? Because I mean, that's obviously one of the values of digital devices that you can take out of the classroom. Uh, and those type of questions kind of beget the, 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 the process to getting to that point where you say, okay, what's your approach to digital curriculum? And, and how do you, you know, and, and then that kind of leads the, the way into OER. Um, that is kind of that way with, uh, with all the initiatives, all those kind of doorways that I, I mentioned. And, and again, other states will have different things. 
Iowa, one of their doorways is not online learning uh, because we're just not as big uh, of a state with that. We do a little more with blended learning, specialist blended learning models, but other states have a much bigger uh, usage of online learning in the state. And so there'd be a big doorway uh, to do that through uh, for OER. Competency based education. I know some states are looking uh, or have done a lot with that um, in terms of, uh, you know, Idaho, New Hampshire, those type of states. And so OER could be a great way to go and apply um, that to competency based ed and find how it connects. That's great. Thank you. Um, I see um, Anne is still with us and um, and put in a comment that um, you really helped her get started in, in Pennsylvania. And Anne is actually our next speaker uh, who will be sharing her journey um, on April 11th at 11 a.m. Pacific. And Anne, I'm just wondering if you, I don't know if you have any questions for Evan or if you just want to um, say a little something about kind of how you connected with Evan and, and how um, he helped you get started. Cause I think that's, that's such a wonderful illustration of, of the power of, of uh, this cross state collaboration that we're seeing more and more. Sure, thank you, Megan. And thanks again, Evan. Um, we reached out to Evan because we're also um, an education service agency in Pennsylvania. We're called Intermediate Units. Um, so we were excited as we were we kept being pulled to OER Commons and the hubs and we went to the hubs and found Iowa there and we're like, hey, somebody's doing exactly what we're thinking about. So um, Evan was uh, kind enough to connect virtually with, with me and um, give us some uh, direction what they had done and, um, you know, things that they were planning for the future. And so that helped guide us a little bit on our way. We were able to look at um, his hub as well as the other hubs to figure out how to design our own hub and and some things on our end. So um, it was great. And then Evan also um, leads the AESA, I believe I put that in the right order, um, affinity groups. Um, I myself haven't been able to attend that, but I have a project team um, and uh, Kevin Connor and uh, Jeff Rothenberger both attend those. Um, and kind of bring back to us. We try to divvy up the work. We're pretty much all volunteers in Pennsylvania trying to make this work. Our state is very similar to Iowa, actually, without a Department of Ed, um, Ed Tech uh, leader and everything. So we kind of act in uh, loco parentis for, for the Department of Ed. Mm -hmm. And um, so we have a lot of similarities and um, I wanted to make sure Evan went first <laughs> so we could all hear about his experience before we heard about PA's experience um, because I thought it was important for everyone to, to see what Evan uh, had done in Iowa um, before we share what we did in PA. I put the, by the way, the, the, um, the group that Anne referenced, uh, the, o, the AEA, AESA affinity group, uh, I put the link to um, our uh, space. We've got a Google uh, 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 community um, space that's just, um, it has our recordings from our meetings and such. We basically meet uh, virtually via Zoom uh, once a quarter um, and um, open if you want to, if you want to join and participate. Um, but I, Pennsylvania, Iowa, and Nebraska um, are all kind of in similar boats and we've all uh, actually elected to use the OER Commons too, but in terms of the relationship of the service agencies in the state and the Department of Education to, to districts. So the three of us uh, do a lot of collaboration through uh, that, um, that group, and we are always interested to hear, hear from others too and uh, uh, expand our collaboration. And it doesn't have to be intermediary units like us. I mean, it can be uh, other, other groups. Um, or districts or higher education institutions or whatever the case is, um, we're, we're looking to expand. So that's, uh, that's open. That's a way to further connect with Anne and me, uh, or I should say, you know, the, the uh, Pennsylvania I use, the Iowa AEAs and the Nebraska ESUs, because we we do a lot of our collaboration through that. Wonderful. And you're so good at keeping all the acronyms straight for these inter intermediaries, too. Sometimes yes. they get a little tongue-tied. <laughs> But um, yeah, I just wanted to, we're, we're coming up on the hour and I just wanted to just 
put out a final call out to any questions. I know we have some other states represented on the call. Um, so speak now or um, we'll start to, to wrap it up. And um, yeah, I just wanted thank uh, Evan so much. Uh, this was, you know, just something that we asked these, these wonderful leaders to, to, to do, to devote some of their time to sharing their stories. And we really hope you all found it informative. And like I said, uh, we'll be sharing the recording. And it's wonderful that um, Evan and Anne, who's our next speaker on April 11th, um, are both, you know, really had their arms open for collaboration, which is wonderful to see states supporting each other. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll just uh, leave it at that. And, and um, please uh, stay tuned for our next uh, series on April 11th with Anne uh, sharing her story of OER adoption and um, all the great things that she's doing across Pennsylvania. Thanks everybody for joining us. We'll see you next time.